I pray that you would open every heart, you would open every mind, that you would open every spirit that is in this house tonight, that Jesus that would hear clearly the voice, hear clearly your purpose and your plan. God, I bind and rebuke every spirit of hindrance, every spirit of doubt. God, I bind and rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But God, I loose your liberty. I loose your freedom, not only in this pulpit, but God, also in the pew. Jesus, that we would come, that we would come under the understanding of your precious, powerful, anointed word. God, I thank you tonight for your wonderful, wonderful word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated this evening. <clears throat> there is much that is said about the law contained in the book of Leviticus. And contained within its margins are the precepts and the principles that help guide and govern Israel for hundreds of years. Not only was the law unbreakable and devoid of any interpretation by humanity until the evolvement of the Sadducee and the Pharisee and the Sanhedrin, it was also unbearable. For the standards that were set, it became clear to the creator of the law that humanity could never find redemption while traveling on its current segue of sacrifice. That when you look at the heartbeat of the tabernacle and the temple, the heartbeat of the sacred sacraments were blood. For blood was the avenue of atonement. We know that the blood was the foundation of not only the tabernacle and the wilderness, but as I taught last Wednesday evening, it was also the sacred sacrament of the temple that was built in Jerusalem. It was the course that God set of redemption at Calvary when He shed His blood for all of humanity. He set it in motion and forever settled it in His wonderfully inspired and written Word of God. That without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. We know that the blood was the foundation of not only the tabernacle and the wilderness, but that's why we know that the blood, it has an unparalleled process and promise when contained in God's holy written Word. Yet, we cannot stop at the blood. We must, as a church and as a child of God, we must go deeper in our examination of what would compel Christ to endure and to endeavor to die in the most humiliating and public manner conceived by the Romans that could ever be placed upon humanity. Only love in its purest and truest form could convince any conscience to lay down life and forfeit any future of any hope of life concerning the flesh so that others may live by that act of dedication of death that God established at Calvary. It was done so that I may have life in this house and not just have life, but what? Have life more abundantly. What? By the act of His sacrifice. I know that that I can live with freedom and liberty in this wonderful, sacred house. The tabernacle, it was a bloody place. It's not what we would envision the house of God today. It was a bloody place. You could smell it if you got downwind from it. It was... It was full of dead carcasses. It smelled of carcasses that no longer had the blood and the bowel in them. It was the smell of blood that was sprinkled upon the mercy seat. 
The blood that was shed was all done in accordance to the law to make restitution for the broken commandments that people came and they brought the bull and the lamb and the dove to make restitution for their sins. And I'll tell you that the house of God and our, our picture of it, it would differ greatly if we could travel back to the wilderness and to the temple that was built in Jerusalem. That when you walked in, you would not see the minister, you would not see the priest dressed in a suit and tie for that. He would not have a pocket square. He would not have on a white shirt. But you know what? He would have a knife in his hand. In his garments, they would be bloodstained. Why? Because it was his daily duty to make sure that that sacrifice was offered upon the altar. So when we come into the house of God, then we, we step over a piece of trash and we pick it up and we think, my goodness, what has the house of God come to? If you could really see the original house of God. It was bloody. It was dirty. It was where people came to bring their sins. And it, it smelled. I worked for a couple of years in high school in a butcher shop. Now that was an interesting experience. I didn't get to play too much with knives. I was the guy who was dragging and hauling what was not edible out of of that place. It was rough. It was disgusting. And it left an inevitable mark upon my sinuses and my senses. It reminds me, I think that it would be comparable to what the early tabernacle and temple was. This is a wonderful place. The reason why this place is made wonderful it was because by the sacrifice of one that we were all justified with. That's why we have carpet in here. That's why we have pews in here. Why? Because the blood of the Lamb was enough. I'm thankful tonight that the blood of the Lamb made restitution for my sins. Yet, when you examine the early church that was founded in field in the book of Acts, you will find that the heartbeat of the church, it was love. Now before you say, oh Lord, Brother Kewen, he's going, just, just hear me for a few moments tonight. Not only must we have the blood applied to our lives, you and I must have the understanding of the law that Christ established. The Scriptures command us to love God more than anything else, and then to love others, and then what? To love ourselves. Matthew 22 and 37 through 40 states that Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is the first and the great commandment. And the second commandment is like unto it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments, what? Hang all the law and the prophets. That's a pretty powerful verse that when we as the church can fully and completely embrace and apply these commandments to our lives, then here is my understanding of the Word of God, that when we can fully love God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul and then we can look at our neighbor and love them more than we love ourselves. then guess what? We're not going to have any problem keeping uh, the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses uh, on the mountain. Uh, we're not going to have any problem keeping the law that is to follow because here is the thing, if we do not love God, then why would we keep His commandments and why would we love His principles principles and his concepts when it comes to the house of God. You see, before you can love the law, you've got to love God. But we are raising people. And I have seen people within the church setting itself that they love the law. And they love the doctrine. And they love the preached principles of the Word of God. 
But when you examine their life, they have learned to live hidden beneath the curtain of the doctrine, and they have learned to live hidden beneath the curtain of the law. That when it comes to it, you'll not really find the law and the love of God working in tandem in their lives. Let me just tell you right here and right now that the greatest commandment that we can ever fulfill uh, and find in the word of God. Uh, he said, Thou shalt love uh, the Lord thy God uh, with all of thy heart. And if you love God with all of your heart, what does that tell me? There's not going to be a lot of room for sin. There's not going to be a lot of room for the things of the world to creep into your life. That if you are continually and constantly abounding in the love of God, then what you are doing is showing compassion to those that are around you. And if you love God, then you're going to value what God loved. And you'll find no greater love contained in the Scripture or in the world. When God said, greater love hath no man than he would what? lay down his life for a friend. For God is what? The friend that sticketh closer than the brother. You cannot be right with God in wrong with your brother or your sister. It is spiritually an impossibility. Now you can be in love with the law. You can be in love with the precepts and the concepts. But if you do not love God, the Bible said, hang all the law and the prophets. The law is imperative to the love. You cannot administer the law without love. You cannot administer the law without compassion and without passion for those that are around you. When we as the church can fully embrace these commandments to our lives, then the ten I fully believe that Moses was given will not be broken as often as they are. And John 14 and 15 gives complete clarity. He said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. It doesn't get any clearer than that. You cannot and will not keep the commandments of God unbroken in your life when you constantly and only look at the finger that wrote the law and you cannot look past the finger and see the hand that was nailed to an old rugged cross for your sins. The finger, it wrote the law, but the hand exemplified the love and the mercy and the grace of God. Don't let me get so caught up in the law. Don't let me get caught up so much in the precepts and the concepts that I understand that the greatest commandment that I could ever have abounding in my life uh, is to love the Lord my God uh, with all of my heart uh, and with all of my soul uh, and with what? All of my uh, mind. Uh, I'm thankful tonight uh, that He gave the commandment that think on these things. Uh, it's not enough that you profess it with your mouth. Uh, what's in your heart uh, and what is in your mind uh, will ultimately be exemplified uh, and break forth from your mouth because what does the Bible say that from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh if you're around somebody very long you'll understand where their treasure is if you're around somebody very long you'll know if they have the love and the fruits of God operating and being orchestrated in their life because why from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh and what comes out of our mouth is got to be emanating with the love of God. It's got to be radiant with His mercy and with His grace. We have a hard time breaking and bruising the things we love. It is natural to want to protect your family and your home. 
we must apply that same level of love to the church and what it was designed for. When we have the true love of God present and represented in our personal spiritual lives, we will have no issue fulfilling the commandment contained in Galatians 6 and 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It is impossible to be like Christ and please Him without having love and compassion for others. That when we have the love of God flowing through the church in its body, we will have passion for worship, we will have passion for praise, and we will have passion for prayer and the Word of God. Passion deals with the tangible things of God, and it will revolutionize your prayer life, and it will see how God functions in this house. But when you give birth to compassion uh, is where we begin to look beyond the house of God uh, for those that are bruised uh, for those that are broken uh, and for those that are beyond the world's ability uh, to restore uh, and to repair uh, and to mend uh, our relationship with God uh, it is a vertical relationship with God uh, but our relationship with others uh, it is horizontal uh, it is a shallow uh, and an insecure with God uh, that cannot reach across the aisle uh, to the brother and the sister that is sitting next to you uh, and lend a hand of prayer uh, and lend a hand of compassion uh, and not give to them a word uh, of encouragement. Uh, I pray tonight uh, that we be a church of compassion uh, that I'm willing to uplift uh, I'm willing to uphold uh, and pray until God uh, not only meets my need uh, but meets your need. Uh, let me put aside my own wants uh, and my own desires in this house uh, and fulfill uh, the commandment of God uh, and love Him uh, and love you uh, as I love myself. I don't want to be so selfish that the only name mentioned in my prayer life is for my own needs and for my own problems and for my own situations. But God, let me view my neighbor as an avenue to fulfill one of the commandments of God and pray for them and love them and uphold them through prayer. Our relationship with God, it goes up and down. But our relationship with one another, it goes this way. The church that is called by His name, I'm fixing to just probably maybe lose a couple of you, but just hang with me. We are not members of a commune, but we are members of a community. God never intended that His church or those called by His name separate themselves from the rest of the world. We are called to be different and we are called to be distinct. We are called to be holy. We are called to be godly. And we are called to be righteous. We are called to come out of darkness into His marvelous light. Uh, but never ever will you find contained in the Word of God where we have the commandment uh, and we have the justification uh, to divorce ourselves uh, from those that are in the world uh, that are lost, uh, that are bruised, uh, that are broken, uh, and that are reeling from the circumstances of life. Uh, for if we divorce ourselves from the world, uh, we will never fulfill the commandments uh, when God said uh, you've got to love uh, your neighbor as you love yourself uh, we've got to be willing to walk into a world uh, and be separate uh, in our beliefs uh, separate in our dress uh, separate in how we look uh, but be willing and prayerful and spiritual enough uh, that I can sit down with a sinner uh, I can break bread uh, with a broken uh, and they are not going to affect uh, and influence me uh, in my personal uh, and understanding beliefs. Uh, Christ made it His mission uh, that He ate and drank and slept uh, with the publicans and the sinners. Uh, we must be spiritual uh, and godly enough uh, and have enough of the love of God emanating from us that we are willing uh, to walk in the footsteps of Christ. 
we cannot divorce ourselves from this messy, messed up, mixed up world. But what you have to do is to make sure that you're fulfilling the law of Christ. That's to love your neighbor as you love yourself. We have no hesitation in voicing our love for God and the passion for the principles that make up His character, which is the first commandment. Yet we have a harder time when we come to the portion of the verse that is contained to us personally. And the second commandment is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. That sounds like to me, and I'm no deep theologian, but that sounds like to me, Brother Allen, it doesn't matter what you believe. If you don't love God and love your neighbor, it's null and void after that. It is not possible for my searching of the Scriptures, it is not possible for someone to love God with all of their heart and look upon those that are lost without compassion and feel the statement and the passion that embody the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ when He said, For God so loved the world. That's the law of Christ. Love the world. We must be reminded from time to time that Christ didn't just die for me. He didn't. He didn't just die for me. He didn't just hang on an old rugged cross for the gear for my sins, although I'm grateful that He did. You know what He did? He died for all of humanity. All mankind. The poor and the wealthy. The lame and the whole. The same blood that flowed from Calvary is the same blood that we all share in this house. The last moments of Christ, let me remind you, was spent not in the presence of His disciples, not sitting at the feet of those that He loved most, of Peter, James, and John, but the very last moments of his life, culminating in one of the greatest scenes uh, in the Bible. He was nailed on a cross between two thieves. How fitting of a life. How fitting of a life. Thankful tonight that while robed in flesh and walking, he ministered among the sinners, the broken, and where I stand tonight, the unwanted. There are many historians that have lived and believed that the early church in Jerusalem numbered in the tens of thousands. Jesus told them in Acts 1 and 8, But ye shall receive power after that which the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The early church evangelized Jerusalem. Hear me tonight. The early church evangelized Jerusalem with great power and purpose. The Bible said that it was testified of those that they what? Turned their world upside down. But when you examine closely the Word of God, and you examine closely, these are the last words of God. For right after this verse, the Bible said that He has called up into heaven, and there is not another earthly word ministered and uttered by Christ. And he said that you shall be witnesses both unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And they turned Jerusalem upside down with great power and great purpose. But that is where the revival it was contained and it stalled. However, that is not what the last words of Christ were. They were to be witnesses where not only only in Jerusalem, but in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part 
parts of the earth. It does not matter if you come to the house of God and you have the witness of being righteous and holy and godly here. You've got to go to your job place. You've got to go to your family back home. You've got to take it to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. You cannot allow the revival and the understanding of the word of God to remain in this house. It's got to go with you when you leave and you've got to love God enough and love those that are around you enough that you are willing to share with passion and compassion the wonderful word of God. When the apostles did not answer the calling and commandment of God, he took matters into his own hands. Guess what he did? He called the apostle Paul, who was the very agent of the persecution in the first place. I find that fascinating. Brother Kevin, Paul is the reason that the church scattered in Jerusalem. He could persecute, imprison, and chain torture anybody that knew. He's the reason that the church literally scattered in every direction from Jerusalem. And the Bible said that he heard that there was a stronghold at Antioch. So guess where he went? On his way. God not only used the influence of the Apostle Paul when he did not even believe the message, but here is the wonderful thing of God. Brother Taylor, that when it come time, he said, Paul, you're the reason that the revival is spread. Now you're going to be the voice that carries and brings the revival to its fulfillment and to its fruition. That's how wonderful the Word of God is. That when the Apostles stayed put in Jerusalem, God said, said, uh, okay, uh, if you're not going to work within the boundaries and the parameters I've done for you, uh, I'll raise up my own voice. Uh, I'll raise up my own man. uh, And on a dusty road uh, on the way to Damascus, uh, I'm thankful that God, uh, he called the apostle Paul uh, and he got to preach uh, in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Why? Uh, Because it was his influence uh, in the first place uh, that spread the revival abroad. How wonderful is that? The very influence that people were running from. The very influence that people feared. The very influence that people, uh, they cowered and they quaked uh, was the very voice just a few chapters later uh, that is preaching, uh, that is telling them uh, of Christ crucified uh, and Him risen uh, from the grave. Uh, You cannot tell me that the love of God uh, cannot make a difference in your life. Uh, The world needs to hear uh, and see your witness uh, and uh, your influence. God took things into His own hands. God will not give His consent for a church to grow that will not obey the Word of God and will not reach for those beyond our levels of comfort. And what is troubling in these words, the Bible says... And Saul, consenting unto his death, and at the time that there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. This is Acts 8 and 1. And then it says, Except the apostles. God will not give His consent for a church to grow that will not obey the Word of God and reach for those that are beyond our levels of comfort. But what is the most troubling about this Scripture is it says, except the apostles. That's why God had a meeting with Saul on the dusty road to Damascus. You know why? Because all the other apostles... They were still in Jerusalem trying to have revival. And God was saying, hey, hey, Samaria needs you. Judea needs you. The uttermost parts of the earth needs you. Can I tell somebody in this house tonight, your job needs you. Your home needs you. Your family, it needs you. God has raised you up as Paul on the dusty road 
to be a voice and to be a witness. Be the light. Be the voice of the love of God in your home. I look forward to the foreign mission service every year in the event that I refuse to miss at general conference. I'm thankful for the giving that this church has been exemplary with over the years. You're renowned for your giving. I'll sit in that foreign mission service, Sister Jerry, and just cry. I can't help it. I sit here almost think about it. You can't help but be moved by it. I, I don't care if my wife has to wheel me in there on a stretcher. I, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to miss that service. I love it when they carry those signs to Jerry. They tell of what God is doing in revival all around the world. It's, it's moving. When they tell of the tens of thousands that are receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And what you realize is you play an important and prominent role in your giving and in your sacrifice. But I believe that from time to time, it can become easy to give our money to missions because we never have to see the faces of those that we are reaching. It can become convenient to reach for those on foreign soil, allowing us to forget that while we are in this church tonight, there are those that are lost within walking distance of these walls. Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. The uttermost part may be across your street in a home that desperately needs the Word of God. Your Judea may be your job. Your Samaria may be some distant family that right now is praying, God, send me the answer. Send me. Send me somebody. We can be that person. When true passion and love for the lost grip us, Nationality will not matter and we will not allow the boundaries of culture to determine who is worthy of this house because true passion and love knows no boundaries. We cannot become the church that is willing to offer those that are lost our opinions and merely the doctrine. That's not going to do them really any good until they become established in the house. We have to be willing as the good Samaritan was to stop and anoint the wounds of the wounded with oil leading them to the safety of God's house. Luke 10, 33-34 gives you and I the biblical model of the church. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him in to an inn, and took care of him. The good Samaritan was willing to invest in him more than he knew he was going to get back monetarily. People are not a very sound investment. Take it from a student pastor of 18 years. It's not a very sound investment. Years and years of pouring your heart and soul into people, in young people, to watch it fade with one ill-timed decision. But the beauty is this, is that you cannot count the cost. That's God's job. Before you invest, you cannot expect to get such and such return on your investment. You can't do that. Otherwise, you will never, ever invest. He said he took care of him. He even offered money, and he said, if he exceed this limit, when I come back, I will settle up with you. He did not care. He emanated the love of God. A good Samaritan was willing to invest in him more than he knew he was going to get back monetarily. It is our job to sow and let God give the increase. Let God give the increase. I've learned over the years that the more I'm involved in, the worse it gets. But if I can just allow God to be God, how wonderful things usually work out. We do not want to start comparing the cost of sacrifice because at Calvary, Christ gave everything so that we might be blessed enough to give something back to His kingdom. The true nature of compassion is such that it thinks more of others than it thinks of itself. 
This is the mirror of love's response. For the Bible says that charity seeketh not her own. I don't know who charity was, but she must have been a wonderful person. I got a few laughs. (laughs) I might keep that one. I don't know who she was, but she must have been a wonderful person. She said, charity seeketh not her own. Why? Because she was looking beyond to help somebody else. If all your family is living for God, don't be content with just that blessing. Pray for somebody else's family. If all is well in your life, bear you one another's burdens. This is the law of Christ. Uplift them. Encourage them. Don't give them a lecture on Facebook. Give them a few moments of your time in a prayer room. Be the church that emanates the love of God. Love God and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. We as the church of the living God must be go beyond seeing people as vessels that are lost. When you see the hurting, give them your hand to help them up and out of the ditch where they were robbed, where they were wounded, and where they were left to die from the wounds inflicted by the sins of the world. And how many is thankful that one day when you were in that ditch, somebody came along and offered you the hand of love. Thankful tonight that this is a house full of good Samaritans. I don't want to have the spirit of the Levite. I don't want to have that spirit working among us. Because you know what? We will pick and choose who we help based upon nationality and based upon the size of their pocketbook and the influence of their city. Somebody asked me the other day, said, Brother Guin, what are you trying to do in Toledo? I said, I'm trying to do one of two things. I said, I'm trying to win the person that has the most influence in this community. Or I'm trying to win the worst. The just absolutely most vile person that is here. Because if we can win the opposite ends of the spectrum, think of the influence we can have in this community. Reach for everybody. If you try to separate the wheat from the tares, that's God's job. A church with compassion is a body with arms, and our love for souls should not only reach across the seas, but it should compel us to reach our neighbors and our friends, and oftentimes that is just simply reaching across the street or reaching across the aisle or reaching across our desk. Exiled on a lonely island in the Aegean Sea, I'm fastly drawing to a close. John learned his status for the revelatory voice of God. He gives stunning insight and detail concerning the three main topics, first of which was Jesus Christ, second of which was the church, and third of which was future events, of which I will confess I am not an eschatology professor. I am terrified. I sleep with the lights on when I read the book of Revelations. I'm just, I am a big scaredy cat. My, I read the book of Revelations, and I promise you, I, I tiptoe around the house with a baseball bat. So if you ever see Revelations open on my desk, don't knock on my door at dark. <laughs> I'm not responsible for my actions. You know, you've got, you've got you know, the, well, the beast with three horns, you, you know, and the face of a lion and the claw of a bat. I mean, I'm just like, you know, my goodness, this is frightening stuff. You know, I... I'm going to go back to reading, reading in, in, about David and Goliath here, you know, stuff that my limited mental capacity can understand, you know. And then you've got the guy that walks in, and he's able to just read it off, and you're like, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Never been able to do that. But John could. John, in his book, he writes extensively about the seven churches of Asia Minor which many believe represented a prophetic panorama of the seven church ages in which we are currently experiencing. Of the seven, there are three that singled out for their passion and compassion or lack thereof. And it is written with chilling and a cautionary tale of what happens when we cast aside God's design purpose for His church. It's a chilling narrative. John has this to say about the church at Ephesus in Revelations 2, 2 through 4. He said, And I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou canst try which they say are apostles, and not hast found them liars. And hast borne and have patience, for my name's sake have labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because what? Thou hast left thy first 
love. God holds it against us when we do not love Him. For He is a jealous and a terrible God. He's a jealous God. Remember what happened when the Philistines put the Ark of the Covenant in the same house with, with their God. Remember, it was found on its face. They put it upright, tried to cover it up, and the next day, guess what happened? His head and his hands were cut off. Be careful what you put in the same house with God. If it constantly is wounded and doesn't work out, that may be a sign that God's a little jealous. Amen? As you're standing tonight. Then again, he addresses the same subjects when God places his focus upon the church in Laodicea in Revelation 3, 15 through 17. He said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He said, you've forgotten where you came from. You've forgotten that, that you were lost. You've forgotten that you were poor. You've forgotten that you were blind, that you were naked, that you were destitute, that you're beyond the love of God. And now, because you've built this great edifice, because now you are working wonderful, you've forgotten where you come from. I want to always remember that the love of God is the reason that I'm here. Amen? Amen. Yet the church in Philadelphia maintained its first love. And John wrote these words in Revelations 3 and 8. He said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and have kept my word, and hast not denied my name. I'm thankful tonight for the wonderful, lovely name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm in love with that name. I don't know about you, but I'm still in love with Jesus. I'm still in love with Jesus. God, never let me get over my first love. The love of your spirit. The love of your presence. God, never let me get over your love that, that wanted me to pray all night long. That wanted me to commune with you. That wanted me to please you. That was willing to give up the things of the world and the things of the flesh to please you. God, help us to emanate with love for you and a love for those that are surrounding us. Why don't we lift our hands and just love Him tonight. God, I love you, Jesus. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you, God, for your presence and for your power. God, I want to fulfill not only the law, but God, fulfill your law. That is to love you and then to love my neighbor. God, help me to see somebody that is bruised and broken. God, with compassion. Help me, Jesus, to have compassion on those as you had compassion on a miserable wretch like me. Thank you, Jesus. I don't ever want to forget the ditch that God brought me out of. I never want to forget the love that was shown to me. Thank goodness there was a Samaritan that came by. How many is thankful for the helping hand? How many is thankful for a church body that is wonderful, that is willing to help? How many is thankful for a church body that you know is praying for you, uplifting you in prayer? I'm thankful tonight to know that the brothers and the sisters in Christ Jesus, that there is love emanating and abounding among us. Amen. One again, let's just lift our hands and love Him as we're being dismissed tonight. God, I thank You for Your Spirit. God, I thank You for Your presence and for Your power. That Your anointing, that Your presence, God, strengthens.